So you came up with lots of interesting um, applications without even knowing about their existence. Uh, so I'm pretty, um, I'm, uh, I'm pretty happy that you came up with uh, lots of ways of minimizing congestion. And I saw a lot of focus on um, public transportation too, too which is uh, pretty good. Okay, so let's go back to uh, what is the main problem? What are we trying to solve? Um, so the transportation, the transportation's purpose is to move um, vehicles and people um, when you have varying demand, okay? So varying temporal rates, so specifically tempor the, uh, time varying demand. So you have demand that changes over time. Um, and you are limited by the capacity of a system and by networks of roads, right? Unless you have a land cruiser, you're not going to drive off the road and, uh, I don't know, through buildings and stuff. Uh, or when you're living in Dubai, you can do that, but uh, not around here. So you're limited by the roads, and um, you have incidents that might happen that might reduce your capacity. And, <coughs> and you're also, um, you can be um, delayed by other people who are also joining the roads, um, and so on. So there's human factors involved. So you could have people stopping in the middle of the road uh, for a coffee at Tim Hortons on the side of the street, let's say. That delays people. Um, and also you have the action. So we were talking in the morning about having to slow down because the person ahead of you is slower. You don't want to bump into them. So those are all human factors. Uh, a lot of accidents are due to human factors. And so basically, you can't fully control the motion of the, of the vehicles and people, um, such as what you would do in computer networks, OK? How we send um, packets, internet messages, basically, across the internet um, through servers is um, basically computer networks. That's automated. Um, and you can optimize how, how you, you send it. Well, if you tell someone what, you shouldn't take this route, take the other route, they might not always follow what you tell them. So you want to maximize mobility with lots of um, constraints, uh, such as um, also not exceeding a certain level of pollution. So that's where a lot of the other um, mechanisms, such as using public transport, walking, running, biking, uh, are uh, very good alternatives for um, vehicles because they also reduce the level of pollution. Now, and also a good mobility, so reasonable level of service. Okay, so we're talking about delay. One of the common notions that we talk about, a bad thing, basically, is delay. So the example here shows you the difference between other systems and transportation. Um, if you have unlimited capacity, first of all, you have no delay, right? You can keep on adding, um, adding to density, and then the flow would keep going up. However, that is not the case. In, um, in a conveyor belt, uh, when you add more demand, the, the, the uh, flow goes up. But that's not the case in transportation because, as we saw, instead of going up here, A, it goes down here to B. Okay? So as density goes up, flow will go down when you exceed this capacity. Uh, so demand exceeds normal capacity at times. Uh, so you, you might have delay to enter the system. You might have, for example, an on-ramp to a freeway. You have delay due to breakdown. So you have congestion on the road. And as we see, as we saw, there's a big difference between the conveyor belt and the transportation system. And uh, at intersections, you also have right of way. The rightmost vehicle can start, or the vehicle that um, that joined the intersection first might um, might would go through if it's an all-way stop. And you have supply and capacity reduction or incidents. All of these lead to delay. 
So the things that are needed include long-term planning, um, and short-term operations, things such as traffic lights and new technologies uh, though, that are grouped into what is called ITS, Intelligent Transportation Systems. So these include continuous network-wise monitoring and detection, hardware and software. Here you start seeing things from smart infrastructure, okay? Uh, this is infrastructure, it might be a bit smart, but now we're talking about things that you're doing in real time. You're reacting to changes in the environment and varying demand in real time. So uh, continuous estimation, regulation, and optimal control. So you're trying to predict what's going to happen next, where congestion is going to happen. You're trying to uh, remove those things before they happen. So it's a, an, a, an optimal control strategy so that uh, you reduce the problems. And you need, of course, wireline and wireless communication, which are high, high speed to get your data, yeah. So I, I just had an idea just now. Go ahead. So you, you know, there are like those, um, what if you make the road move instead of the car? <laughs> so, so, so here's what you can do, here's what you can do. You can have a conveyor belt, right? You can have the road like a conveyor belt. You put the vehicle on it yeah. and the conveyor belt will. Yeah. I'm okay with that idea. Like, you, you're actually parking. Say if the, the thing goes at like 50 km per hour. And you can go at 250 if, if you do that. Yeah, like, and, like people will be actually parking so there will be more parking. Okay, now if you measure the length of roads and calculate the amount of money that it would take to make all the roads like this, then you realize that it's not that doable, at least not today. Well, that creates jobs, that creates like a mega project for more people. But you need to stop, uh, you need to start somehow, right? So where do you get that big investment? So those are, those are things that over the years would go through. One of the things is the automated cars. cars. If, you, if you do have autonomous cars in the future, they would run like that. They would be, you wouldn't need that safety uh, distance between them. Yeah. You could put them two inches apart and they'd be going at 200 kilometers per hour. And all of a sudden your capacity is far higher. Yeah. Okay, so those are the things where we will see, hopefully in your lifetime, if not mine, um, and hopefully a lot of you will help contribute to those technologies. It's a, it's a matter of time and we will see. There are issues, there are things also blocking those changes. As we said, a lot of people don't like change. A lot of policy decisions need to be made for that. Um, we're still at the viewpoint of, or some people are still at the viewpoint of uh, add one more lane or increase the capacity. That, that doesn't work, but it does need some drastic changes like that to solve uh, the problem. Okay, so I was going to that. <laughs> so automation, driverless uh, cars. Okay, so what is, uh, what is ITS? I is for intelligent. We're talking about smart or intelligent throughout the course. Um, it's a set, set of technologies. And most of these technologies are coming from the field of um, computer engineering and uh, computer science. So these technologies we're applying for transportation in order to save lives, time, and money. So the two things that we use, uh, say, uh, use most in transportation is safety and mobility, okay? Uh, because time and money can be defined into mobility and lives into um, safety. So um, these, an intelligent transportation system includes special sensors and electronic uh, technologies, and you have integrated communications between different elements of the system in order to mitigate the um, problems of surface transportation. Now, it's a, it's a discipline which is between different uh, fields. It's interdisciplinary, as we said, and its business is to deal with um, 
co the getting that information and helping move people across, move uh, movement of people and goods um, while it's doing that. So ITS includes information technology, communication technology, vehicles, roads, and operation centers. OK, so let's see. The, this is a congested city, or relatively congested city. We've seen far worse. Um, one of the good analogies of a congested city is an intensive care unit patient. OK? Um, so if we leave things as is, if we don't solve the problem right away, that person is going to die. And that system is going to break down. So we need to uh, catch the problem immediately and not let things break down and because the costs, the cost of time, um, delay of people costs a lot of money. And there's a lot of economic losses due to that. If you spend 90 minutes a day on the road, that's money lost. So what usually happens, so what the different building blocks, which I was asking you to work on, uh, include monitoring. So loop detectors, the loop detectors are the inductors or the coils that are put under the pavement. Um, and the information from the CP24 are, are on the roads that have those. It's mostly in highways and some of the major roads. So when a vehicle goes through, it counts it. So when I was talking about standing at the road, uh, at the point on the road, and then counting vehicle, vehicle. So that, that's what a uh, loop detector does, OK? So it, it detects um, these three measures, these three ro road parameter um, uh, measures that we mentioned, so speed, density, and flow. Um, and these are CCTV cameras. GPS is, a, um, is being used far more now. So whoever is driving usually has a cell phone. And that cell phone is connected to the base stations. That information uh, with triangulation with three different base stations, you can know exactly where the person is. And you can get uh, mobility patterns based on that. In addition to that, you have navigation systems. When you have that on, that helps. Um, whoever is providing that navigation information, where different people are, and adjust to that. So that's an, an additional information that is being used. So there's, with a communication system, of course, that's a, that goes into detection, estimation, estimation of um, short-term and long-term traffic. So that's forecasting. And then that goes into um, the centralized system when you're, where you're going to uh, come up with um, decisions, right? How you're going to optimize, what changes you're going to make to optimize the performance based on what you had measured. So here you have real-time control, let's say adaptive uh, uh, signal control. So you're changing the traffic light adaptively based on that. Um, ramp metering. Ramp metering is a technique by which you block the entrance to a highway or you reduce the flow that you al allow to, to, to the highway. It's um, common a lot. It's common in the US. And it's a strategy to basically uh, limit the uh, number of vehicles on the highway. So if you look there, it's limiting them on the left-hand side and not allowing them to go to the right-hand side. Because every new vehicle that joins the highway, it's not, going, it's not just going to be uh, taking a long time. It's also going to be delaying hundreds of other vehicles with it because you're now in the congested state and then the, uh, the flow is going to go down. Okay? So it's better that a vehicle stays there at the traffic light at the entrance of a highway, joins in after, um, let's say, 4 seconds or 10 seconds, and that will um, lead to that vehicle and other vehicles ending up uh, reaching their destination several minutes ahead of time. Um, ATIS is, but we're going to go in detail into these. There's divergence and then guidance information. And uh, again, that information now flows back through a communication medium uh, to deployment. Um, 
So this is implemented through controllers, and some of it uh, goes to um, people, basically, who make uh, decisions of changing roads um, and, and things like that. Um, one other thing that actually happens within the system is automatic detection of uh, incidents. So we, before a, um, uh, a telephone call is made, or in sometimes it's not made, uh, if, uh, I don't know, people are not conscious or something, there's automatic detection based on the changes in the speeds and, um, and sometimes also cameras, right? And that is automated and then you have emergency personnel are notified so that they go to the scene um, and help whoever is there. Okay, this is uh, the project that I'm working on. Um, this is um, the, the point of view, it's called Connected Vehicles and Smart Transportation. Uh, it takes the notion of um, having all these, all this information com coming from different sensors on the road, uh, having communication between the vehicles, um, having all this information coming from different computers, different servers, different databases about um, city events, about weather conditions, about road closures, and all that information gets shared within this um, information management layer. It uses the uh, publish subscribe uh, system, or uh, that, that's one mechanism where you can use it. Uh, so that information gets uh, uh, within, within this medium, whatever agent, whatever um, part of the system that requests other information will have that information come to him, rather than going and saying, give me, um, give me the, the flow on the 401 eastbound between 400 and, um, and 404. Uh, I put a request and then that information comes, it keeps on coming to me. And then again, people who need that information um, after it gets analyzed and processed, they will get the result of it. And this, can, uh, this is going to be used to, for building public app providers and by, by, by uh, public and private app providers to uh, build on using this information for several different uh, applications. Okay. Um, of course, I work on a piece of, of this project, not the whole project. Um, and we're, we're going to be discussing that in the afternoon. I work on the tra traffic assignment part. Okay, so concepts central to ITS. Um, one of the important things is getting this information in a timely fashion. If you're trying to detect an incident or an accident, detecting it half an hour later is not, uh, is not gonna be helpful. So a lot of the information that you're getting, you need to parse it, assess it, and um, process it really, really fast. So what do you use? Servers, massive servers, and if that is not enough, you might use cloud computing because you're doing, uh, you're, you're uh, parsing and analyzing massive data. If you consider each of these detectors as a point of data and you're getting information from them every 20 seconds, um, and there's a lot of historic data that you're also using. Um, it's it's uh, pretty huge. And um, so there are lots of benefits for drivers, um, system owners or, or managers, and um, people, um, almost everyone in the public. Okay, so an important as, uh, thing that is required is having a unifying structure which is similar to what I was showing you uh, in the previous slide, um, where everyone basically speaks the same language, where all the devices uh, work together and um, within the same language. Okay, so general benefits of ITS. So it reduces uh, travel times, so con congestion. You use the uh, network in a far better way, so close to that optimum. Um, better traffic distribution, so there are roads that are not being used, people will have more information about them and will use them. Enhanced safety, convenience, and perception. Uh, as we said, the more you know, the, more, uh, the better you'll use the system. Um, so less energy consumption and uh, pollution. 
Okay, so these are some, I just have a few more slides here. Um, these are some of the broad categories uh, of uh, fields in ITS. Um, you have um, ATMS, ATIS, and AVC, I'm gonna uh, talk about them, but you have another one called um, Advanced Public Transport Systems, Commercial Vehicle Operations. These are for um, businesses that have, let's say, hundreds of trucks. How do they manage them? There are special, special services for those. Advanced Ruler Transportation Systems, um, and ATMS and ATIS are sometimes joined together into what is called ATMIS, which is both of them together. Uh, and AVC is also called sometimes automated highway system. So I'm gonna just discuss a bit about the three of those, and then we're gonna go into another activity. So ATMS, this is from, um, from a management perspective. So Advanced Traveler Traffic Management Center, okay? So an ATMS provides traffic surveillance, that's the first thing you start with, in order to figure out what the current conditions are. So, um, you, they want to optimize subsystems, so if, for example, signals and access controls such as ramp metering, as we said, uh, limiting the number of roads that enter the highway. Um, the, uh, the parts that you need for ATMS are these changeable message signs. You've seen some of these, for example, on the 401. The, it, ge it gives the information about um, the, uh, the congestion that's coming up or whether there are lanes that are blocked and um, so that you have a better, info, a better idea of um, where to go and uh, which routes to take. And uh, these traffic management centers are used for centralized control. So you get the information there, then you have optimization happening from there, and that's where the decisions get made. And um, then, you, of course, you need the communication links. The, most of them are fi fiber optical links between the sources and then going back to the controllers. So when you are at the pedestrian crossing um, uh, signal, um, a, a pedestrian uh, crossing button, and you press that, okay? If you keep on pressing it, what's actually happening is there's someone at the MTO, Ministry of Transportation of Ontario, sitting in a center like this, and they see that coming in. So uh, remember that the next time you're there. Uh, I used to press that a lot, but now I know. So all of those are actually going all the way there and they see that on a screen coming down uh, and then they can see you and then you're in trouble, so, uh, okay. So basically um, that type of information is gets processed right away. It doesn't need to go all the way there, but it does so to, to make sure that everything uh, in the system is working correctly. Um, and most of the offices of the, the MTO are in Toronto, so they will know uh, right away, especially because there are fiber optical uh, lines, which are pretty quick. Um, so that's, that's what they do. Um, they're working in real time, okay? So there, if there are issues that are happening in the, in the system, they're trying to solve it right away. Sometimes there's reactive control, and sometimes there's proactive control. So we anticipate something is gonna, gonna happen before before that, uh, they uh, try to solve it. Um, and um, they have wide range implementation over several different areas. So th there are centralized places that see everything, but you also the want um, for each area to have a, its own controller so that the delay between the decision making and implementing the changes is not, uh, is not too long. And one of the important things is having these um, uh, corridors, so transportation corridors, which is, for example, a long street going from one jurisdiction to another jurisdiction to another city, for example, it's called a corridor. So making sure those are flowing uh, well, uh, because we have a lot of people having those long uh, journeys. And a lot of it is multi-agency and multi-jurisdictional cooperation, so different cities, different ju jurisdictions, um, and ministries. So, um, so if someone gets a ticket in here uh, while driving a U.S., uh, uh, well, uh, uh, yeah, a vehicle from the, from the States, then they have to talk and then go back and try to get the money. 
Uh, by the way, if someone from, from the US gets a ticket in Quebec, they won't have to pay for it uh, because th those people don't talk. Uh, well, if they get it in within the jurisdiction of MTO, they'll have to pay for it. That's the case at least now. Um, okay, so another category is ATIS. So this is from the, from the um, people's perspective, Advanced Traveler Information Systems. So it's traveler rather than management. Uh, so getting real-time traffic information of what's happening and additional information to travelers so one example of that is, for example, what was being perceived on the highway. Another one is, uh, you've seen this in the, if you've been to Spadina subway station, you have a notification there saying 510 streetcars due, uh, let's say in one minute or seven minutes. Uh, I used to live in that area. When I would see due five minutes or more, I would just go out and walk because I used to live five minutes away. So it's actually pretty helpful. It helps you make decisions. Um, and go to your route uh, pretty fast. And uh, also now in the subway systems, you have, and some of the stations, it tells you when the next um, subway is coming. Again, if, it's, if you're going somewhere really important and it's late, you go out and take a bus or take a cab or something else. Um, so this guidance uh, is information which you might have within your car, you might have within your, um, your app, hopefully you're not using that while driving. Uh, you're allowed to use the sound, but you're not supposed to be um, like texting or writing navigation information uh, or trying to get navigation information on your phone while driving. So it gives you different paths, so optimal, um, shortest path or the particular detailed path, path that you're looking for. So we're going to be doing some, uh, some of that analysis uh, in, the, in the afternoon. Um, so it basically, it gives information of how people use their, um, use their route in an efficient way. And you also get other information such as parking information, yellow page information. So I showed you yesterday a picture of uh, the technology in Montreal where you know ahead of time in different parts of the city how many uh, parking spots, street parking spots are available. Uh, and you have that in some of the malls also. Okay, so Last thing is AVC or a a AHS, uh, so automated highway systems. Uh, so in here, you're trying to um, increase throughput and you're trying to minimize the uh, human errors. Um, so um, the idea is to have autopilot-like um, high speeds and to reduce the spacing between the vehicles, as we said. And there are different um, ways, so fully automated would be, um, so platoon operation means all the vehicles would be moving together as a group uh, with the same speed, and then uh, free agent, free agent would, would be some vehicles are automated, some are not, so the, the ones who are automated have to adjust with the, with the uh, regular vehicles. And driver assist is, the, or a lot of it is currently here today, uh, so if you, some of the cars, if you change your lane, uh, it pushes you back to your lane uh, if it's, it's a dangerous move. If, you're, um, if you want to maintain, um, like you can put on a cruise control or adaptive cruise control, uh, and then if, the, if you're sleeping or something or the person in front of you breaks, then uh, the vehicle would give you directions to brake, or uh, sometimes if you get too close, it will brake for you. Uh, so that type of technology. And you also have the, uh, with the sensors that are in the new cars, uh, helping you park, for example, and some vehicles that all, uh, actually uh, park by themselves. So those are pretty decent um, driver assist uh, technology. And so basically a lot of them look for collision avoidance and enhancing the perception. So you have cameras at the back. Um, or additional sensors and automated cruise control, as I mentioned. Okay, so the uh, benefits of ITS, um, one of the issues is that they're costly, so you need to make sure that the benefits outlay, uh, outweigh the costs. Um, and so the benefits we said are society in general and, and individuals and particular uh, roads uh, users also, for example, 
uh, commercial operation. Um, OK, so these are more benefits. And you're right, it creates new industry services, new jobs for lots of people. Um, now, the barriers that you have are a lot, too. So you have legal, um, legal issues, legal liability issues. For example, with um, automated vehicles, if a crash happens, who's responsible? It's automated. It's driving by itself. You're not doing anything. I'm, I'm saying fully automated. And uh, they'll be like, no, we're not responsible. This is something that we gave you. It's like a computer. If your computer breaks down, it's, it breaks down. So that's the thing. There are challenges, right? Now imagine something else. Imagine if you have autonomous vehicles and you have no crashes, zero. What do you do with the uh, insurance companies? You know how powerful they are. They're not going to be happy, are they? Right? What do you do with someone who has worked with filing and accident reports and stuff like that all his life? All his or her life. So you have lots of challenges like that. That one example is with an autonomous vehicle. Um, economic issues. Who pays for what? If we want to have Futurama type of like uh, uh, transportation, or if you want to put conveyor belts on the roads and just put the vehicles on them and move them forward at 250 kilometers an hour. Um, who pays for that? Um, institutional issues. You have so many different um, conditions and, and laws in different places. How can you uh, manage with all of those together? Because in a lot of times, you're driving from, let's say, one jurisdiction to another or one country to another. Um, Technical and system integration issues. A lot of the technologies used, a lot of the uh, servers and uh, centers and, uh, that are existed in, uh, in different cities are not compatible. How do you deal with those issues? And society. How do you convince people of the change? Okay. So these are a lot of the issues that are still, um, that are still on the way. Okay. So we're talking about um different um different type of um technologies that would help people now let's talk about a general um application okay this is an ITS multimodal service multimodal meaning um vehicles public transportation bikes walking so if we're thinking about an ITS multimodal service or an application something that could go on the App Store, something that could go on Google Play, and, uh, and so on. What are the things that um, you would need? These are the questions. Um, if you're, one of you was saying they have an app already. If, if you are trying to develop a multimodal um, service, uh, I've, we've already seen what, how you get some of the data, how you might be able to uh, assess it. What would you need specifically when you have a multimodal service? Try to think of the designs, uh, how you might market this to people, how you might convince people of using them. Um, this is, uh, I guess, the thing that I should add is ATIS service, so Traveler Information Service. Okay? Um, I'm going to switch the groups a bit, um, and then you can start. Yeah, I'll give you. Um, 30 minutes for this.